Howdy and welcome to the Strange West Podcast. This is Trent Tano, word hustler extraordinaire and your host. Bring us in with their rendition of Eno Maraconis for a few dollars more is the mighty Mitch Polzak and the Royal Deuces. And if you're hearing this on your 4th of July week, Mitch will be playing uh, this Thursday, July 6th at Blondie's Bar, located on 540 Valencia Street on the corner of 16th. Admission is free. Show starts at 9. And if you can't make it, you can always find Mitch at MitchPolzak.com. That's Mitch, P-O-L-Z-A-K.com. And this week, we continue with Chapter 3 of Paris High Noon by your friendly neighborhood word hustler, Trent Tano. You can purchase both paperback and ebook at parishighnoon.com. For your cowboy versus Nazi fix, go to parishighnoon.com. And now you can also get your very own Paris High Noon t-shirt at society6.com slash trentano. You can also get mugs, rugs, and even a Paris High Noon shower curtain at society6.com slash trentano. Wear it with pride. And once again, bringing life to the text is the voice talents of James K. Doyle. Thank you again, James, for your time and your talent. So without further ado, here is Chapter 3 of Paris High Noon. Chapter 3, On the Run, Again. Sean ran through the narrow alleys and tight streets that cut and quartered Paris' left bank into a labyrinth of forgotten courtyards and cul-de-sacs. His young heart pounded. His legs burned each time he put leather to paving stone, and he would have stumbled if it weren't for the notion that something worse than the devil was after him. For every house the boy passed, the old cowboy was behind by three. Catfish remembered Professor Brown, a con man he and Lee English used to ride with back in the Wild West, who read from the world's wise men and often quoted them at improper times, like when they were getting shot at. Once when a gang of renegade Sioux chased off their horses and they had to flee on foot, the professor kept shouting, My kingdom for a horse! Running down the streets of Paris made Catfish want to give up his kingdom of saddle-sore bones and worn-out muscles for a mount. It wasn't much of a treasure, but seldom did a cowboy have anything else. "'Slow down a little bit, son,' Catfish said. "'Don't leave your pard behind.' Sean couldn't hear the entire request, only the garbled, "'Petit on pew! Petit on pew!' that wheezed through the old cowboy's mustache. Catfish was able to grab him by the collar. He drew his pistol. He didn't want to hurt the boy, only get his attention after the shootout scattered his wits to the winds. I swear, son, if you don't slow down, I'm going to give you a permanent case of the limpies. Sean didn't comprehend the remark, but he understood the gun. Let's rest in this alley, he said, and moved into the cool shadows. Catfish bent over and put his hands on his knees, making a sucking sound like a broken harmonica as the air strained through his mustache. I am sorry, monsieur, Jean said, but you can shoot and kill people, so you don't have to run. I can't shoot, so I must run. Catfish continued to gulp air, although the alley stunk like a sack of cow shit in the sun. Listen here, son, he said between gasps. Whenever I shot somebody, I always ran. It's just that I'm used to doing my running on a horse, and when I'm on that horse, I usually know where the hell I'm going. Catfish slid his back against the wall. So much sweat poured from his forehead that it stained his hat's prairie brown felt. He took it off to fan himself, and his silver locks fell to his shoulders. His legs began to cramp up, and he had to rub them to get the muscles to relax. Catfish couldn't think of the last time he ran so far and fast. He was no stranger to rough living and fast getaways but the last ten years of his life had been idle. He would have to take it slow and rely on outwitting his adversaries rather than outrunning them. Sean looked at the alleys, thinking of ways to spend the rest of the war right here since no one had found them yet. He had seen the urchins make shelters out of old crates and newspapers. When he entertained the idea, Catfish laughed his easy laugh. Son... This ain't no hole in the wall or robber's roost. It's an alley, and a stinking one at that. 
Sean's cheeks flushed. Catfish put his hand on the boy's shoulder. Listen, son, I need you to think of a low place where the two of us can hole up. There's too much law for us to try and leave Paris right now, but we need a deep hole to jump into while the Bosch are looking for us. Sean's first thought was to go to the hospital and get mother, but he knew right away that this was out of the question. He felt a coward for leaving Moo after killing the sergeant. Sean had never picked up a gun before in his life, his life having been bottles of colored liquor and mediocre wine up until five minutes ago. Now it had all changed in the same way France had changed, violently, without warning. The thought of Moo brought a full moon smile across his chubby, glistening face. Catfish saw the expression. If you're thinking of going back to that pretty girl, you can forget it. The curt words of advice stung Jean's pride like a bumblebee. But, monsieur, you saved her life. She is in debt to you. She must take you in. Son, you might as well know now that a woman doesn't have to do anything she don't want to. You could save their lives a dozen times and never get asked to dinner. Jean covered his face with his hands. Then I don't know where we can hide. Catfish reined in his agitation. The kid was shaky from the fight. Catfish had been a scared kid once, surrounded by rough and violent men. Truth was, the kid had saved his life. The sergeant had enough breath in him to put a final squeeze on the submachine gun if it weren't for the garçon. Say, son, Catfish said. With all of the shooting and running, I never did catch your name. Jean, Jean Malore. Catfish put out his hand. William Hancock, but everyone calls me Catfish. Jean took Catfish's hand and winced a little at the grip. It was the first time anyone had treated him like a man and not just some snotty mama's boy tied to her short apron strings. Why do they call you Catfish? Well, Catfish said with a grin that made his long whisper spread out like the Cheshire Cat, William is what they christened me after I popped out. I got the name Catfish when I was being baptized in the muddy Missouri River. See, the preacher was a tall man and the river was low at the time, so he had to walk out until the water hit his waist. When he dunked me in, a catfish swam by and swallowed me up. The preacher couldn't see two inches in that murk, and when he raised his arms, there was the catfish. Some folks thought it was a miracle, but my mother screamed in such a tone that it made the drunk shy. The preacher was so stunned, he let go of the catfish along with me in its belly. Luckily for me, there were some prized fishermen in the church who brought their poles to the baptism. Thinking of not wasting any more of a good Sunday afternoon, they cast their lines and snagged the catfish that swallowed me. I guess my folks uh, should have named me Jonah. Sean laughed for the first time in a long while. It allowed him to get some air into his tired brain. More tension left him with each burst of laughter. Okay, Jean, now I want you to think, Catfish said, getting back to business. If you were a criminal in Paris, where would you go? Sean thought about it. Sacre bleu, he said, smacking his forehead with an open palm. My brother is a criminal. He's in prison, but I know where his hideout is. Now that's using your thinking muscle, Catfish said. Is it far from here? It is in the 13 Arrondissement, John said. But I must confess that I don't even know where we are or how to get there. Well, that's a problem with an easy solution. Just poke your head out of the alley and read the street signs. Why me, Jean said with a quiver. Because you brought us here. The least you can do is get us out. Fear and uncertainty crept inside Jean's mind. Maybe we should wait until nightfall. It will be dark and no one will see us. That's where you're wrong, Jean. Nighttime is when the law knows the no good are up to their tricks. Besides, it will be harder to get around at night in a part of town that you ain't familiar with. Catfish looked at Jean and added, 
You may want to lose the apron, though. Sean threw the apron in one of the trash cans, feeling he wasn't going to be wearing it or anything like it ever again. He walked out of the alley with his hands in his pocket, whistling a soft tune, exaggerating his steps while he bobbed his head around, looking like a drunken rooster. Sean made it to the corner and still couldn't figure out what part of Paris they were in. For him, the city had consisted of school and the cafe. His mother stopped going to church, since Jude had damned them all. There were times he would run errands for the American expatriates who lived the bohemian life along the left bank and the Latin Quarter. His mother didn't approve of his little jaunts, so he often snuck about the boulevards and streets to deliver the goods for the cafe patrons at their apartments and flats. He found the Americans always tipped well, while the Italians were the worst. Sean walked a little further until he reached the wide Boulevard St. Germain, where the rocky ford of St. Germain de Pre sat in the west. Off in the distance, the Eiffel Tower stood dark against the bright blue sky, with the Nazi blood banner flapping in the summer breeze. He had a fair idea of where they were at, but his brother's hideout was a mile away with Germans covering every corner. Sean returned to the alleyway. I think I can get us to Jude's hideout, Catfish, but it will be a long walk. The walk I don't mind, it's the running that gets my buzzard buzzing. Catfish took off his gun belt and duster. He tucked the pistol in his waist and his bowie knife in the back, untucked his blue shirt so it dropped over his waist, and wrapped his hat and gun belt in the linen duster. Finally, he spread out his arms like Christ on the cross. How do I look? Sean chuckled. You look like a tramp. Well, it wouldn't be the first time I was accused of that. All right, Jean. Catfish braced his hands on his lower back and stretched out his legs. Let's take it slow this time. You lead the way. They walked out of the narrow shadows and into the open streets, where a few Parisians milled around. Catfish didn't know if they were brave or bored, though it was probably a combination of both. People used to freedom couldn't live without it for long, and routine nagged at them to do something, even if it was take a walk to get a cup of coffee. He guessed those who did venture out into the sunny streets of Paris walked along with a sense of guilt and shame. Now that the government had dissolved and declared Paris an open city, they had to trust their enemy. Catfish and Jean walked past an arcade of pushcart peddlers who were slowly coming out of the shock of invasion and realizing that life under the Nazi jackboot still had to go on. Time to do some shopping, Catfish whispered. They stopped by a cart full of berets. A middle-aged peddler in a frayed and rumpled suit sat on a stool next to the cart, his drooping eyes and stubbly chin facing the fountain across the way. Catfish easily pinched a black beret. Jean was amazed at the old cowboy's quick, light fingers, the same fingers that pulled the trigger six times to kill six men were just as apt to snatch a cane, a pair of thick sunglasses, a jacket, and finally a large harvest sack. Once they got a block away from the arcade, Catfish put on the jacket, tucked his silver curls underneath the black beret, and put on the sunglasses. The cowboy hat and gun belt wrapped in his duster went into the harvest sack, which he gave to Jean to hold on to. He then twirled his cane once across his hands and put it out in front of him like a blind man. Up ahead loomed the Jardin du Luxembourg, where the large park of flowers and fountains lay deserted. On any other summer day, it would have been crowded with Parisians and those coming in from the outlying vill villages to enjoy the grassy lawns, misty fountains, and bright flower beds. Now it seemed to have as much attraction as an alkali lake. It depressed Catfish that this patch of paradise could be so easily forsaken. Let's take a stroll through the park, Catfish said. It's the prettiest day I've ever seen. Sean wanted to get to the hideout, and he had to force himself not to run or walk too far ahead of Catfish, who stopped to breathe in the scent of the flowers. But the leisurely pace calmed Sean's nerves. 
John had never seen the lake without boats and the garden without people. It was almost like the massive park was one big graveyard with the attendant statues in perpetual mourning. Catfish thought back to Hiccup and wondered if the Germans would come after his pard. Truth be told, Catfish figured those six soldiers would have shot him down. It was the old cowboy's luck that he ran into incompetent gunfighters. It was like Butch said, you don't have to be good, just not as bad as the other feller. If Catfish would have been shot down, then the Germans wouldn't pursue the matter any further and Hiccup might be spared the cruelty that seemed to come to the Nazis as naturally as breathing. Catfish had left Hiccup alone and surrounded by his enemies, but he couldn't go back for his pard. No more than Jean could go back to his mother, or Moo. He looked at Jean. For now, he would help the boy. He owed the kid that much. <clears throat> Just before they reached Boulevard St. Michel, a rumble and a roar came down the street, causing the pigeons to fly away. A four-wheeled Kubelwagen and a pair of sidecar motorcycles raced down the boulevard, their tires screeching as they made the turn. Jean wanted to turn around and go back to the garden, but Catfish stopped him. They're going too fast for a good look. Besides, they're looking for a cowboy. But isn't that you, Jean said, once the motorcycles drove past? They're looking for some rough, good-looking fellow with a white hat and a big iron on his hip, Catfish said. Not some white-whiskered grandpa with a cane. Although I knew a trail boss that used a cane made from the long pride of a stud bull developed a habit of pointing at it at the ladies. Sean chuckled. Being with the old cowboy made him feel as if he had nothing to fear. It was hard for him to think that not an hour had passed since the shootout. The old cowboy's humor and the ease with which he carried himself had diluted his fear and dread. Jean wondered what made Catfish immune to the shock and dismay of the conquest and occupation. He resolved to try and learn as much as he could about his new life he'd fallen into. Well, we're almost there anyway, monsieur, Jean said, as they crossed the street after another pair of motorcycles speeded past them. Don't call me monsieur, Catfish said. We're pards now, which means we're equals. I won't beg a man, and I don't expect him to beg me. Jean liked the idea of being parts, although he didn't know exactly what it meant. He had few friends, and they tended to treat him more like a dog than a person. Catfish was much older than him, and it seemed wrong to be his equal, but the old cowboy had spoken, and Jean didn't want to rub his new partner the wrong way. They cut across the Port Royal du Champs, heading south to the 13 arrondissement, the outermost ring of the spiral neighborhoods that made up Paris. It was a slum, with shoddy, drooping roofs and walls that leaned against each other like a row of drunks. It was the dark side of Paris, the part of town you didn't brag about. Catfish, Jean said in his best manly voice, which sounded more like the croak of a sick bullfrog. We have arrived. The two brick buildings before them seemed one stone's pluck away from falling down. They reminded catfish of the old quiff dwellings in the southwest that were long ago abandoned and left to return to the earth, the perfect resting place for restless men. Jean slipped through a small gap and walked into the dark crevice between the two houses. Catfish followed. They walked down a flight of stairs that led into the ground, where a large iron door blocked their way. Jean felt along the brick around the door frame and found the loose one. He pulled out the brick, revealing part of the bolt that secured the door. With his slim hand, he was able to move the bar enough to get the door open. He slipped the brick back into place and bolted the door behind them. I guess we should call this place brick in the wall, Catfish said. Has a nice ring to it. Sean chuckled in the darkness. This is my brother's hideout. When he was laying low, he would send me on errands. 
What kind of bandit is your brother? Catfish asked. He hoped the older Malure wasn't a killer. Rustlers and robbers were the kind of criminal element that Catfish worked best with, although every now and then a stone killer would be in the gang. Once he rode with a kid of 16 that went by the moniker of Atlanta Joe, but he had such a light, fuzzy beard that everybody called him Georgia Peach. His fellow outlaws rode him so hard that during a bank robbery he got he gut shot the cashier and then cut off both of his ears. Soon, Georgia Peach had a good collection of ears, and the gang stopped teasing him. He went through his short life with a vicious reputation before a band of Apaches caught up with him. He didn't die quick, but when he did, folks could relax their ears. Catfish considered himself a professional and never killed a man if he could avoid it. Some cases he had to kill or be killed, or captured and tried by a jury, which was pretty much murder at the end of a rope. It was the way of the gun, and Catfish accepted the peril, but killers who murdered for the pure pleasure always bothered him. The way he figured it, killers were cowards, as killing was an easy thing to do. He's the kind of a thief that steals, Jean said. He tried to rob a bank in Lyon three years ago and got caught. Mother never visited him in Amiens, and I was too young to go by myself. Jean led the way through a dark tunnel. The basement stank of rat piss, mold, and darkness. It reminded Catfish of the caverns in New Mexico he used to hide in that stunk of bat shit and whatever vermin that ate it. Better to be alive in a dark, stinking hole than dead in a soft coffin, Catfish would tell himself when he thought he couldn't bear the creeping dark. Closed spaces always bothered him. Unfortunately, most posses and lawmen weren't keen on accommodating outlaws, unless, of course, it was in a jail cell or on the scaffold. It isn't much, but no one will find us here, Mon, I mean, part, John said. Catfish struck a match, and the man-made cavern shivered in the orange flame. John found a candle and lit it. There was a low groan like a man who just ate six tequila worms. Jean almost dropped the candle, but was able to keep his nerve. Catfish pulled out his pistol out of his trousers and cocked the hammer back. The metallic click filled the dark chamber. If you are going to kill me, at least give me five more minutes of sleep, bastard. The drunken voice came from a corner. Catfish moved towards the slumped figure, If you are going to kill me, at least give me five more minutes of sleep, bastard. The drunken voice came from a corner. Catfish moved towards a slumped figure wearing a fine tailored suit three sizes too big with an expensive fedora two sizes too small over his eyes. Jean moved in behind Catfish and brought the candlelight closer. By God, he shouted, Jude, you insolent brat, said the older Malure. You best to call me St. Jude. Everyone calls me St. Jude, especially snot-nosed little brothers. Catfish could smell the stale wine on St. Jude's breath. Snuff out that light before I snuff out your life, St. Jude growled. He tried to get up, but his body heaved. He doubled over and spewed out cheap wine along with chunks of bread and meat onto the basement floor. I thought it was going to stink in this place, and boy, was I right, Catfish said. The old cowboy knew a drunk in any country, and St. Jude fit the role. He helped the stewed bandit up and set him back down on his chair. I thought you were in prison, Jean said. St. Jude coughed up some more bile and spat it out. Ah, yes, Amiens. Well, I think the guards were more worried about the Bosch than they were about us. He reached into the darkness for a bottle, uncorked it with his teeth, and took a generous gulp. Those yellow bastards, as soon as the Bosch came within five miles, they pulled up their skirts and ran away, leaving us in our cages. But fate, she is a cunning whore, I tell you. St. Jude threw his hands in the air, almost hitting Jean with the wine bottle. Cannons fired on the prison and blew away the walls. Those of us who could still breathe and run made a dash for the breach. 
It was the best jailbreak in the history of France. St. Jude took another swig. He was drunk off his freedom and the wine he had liberated from the abandoned cafes. France's panicked hour provided opportunity for sinners. After walking out of the hole in the prison wall, he found himself walking along with thousands of refugees fleeing the oncoming Wehrmacht. Afraid of being spotted in his prison clothes, St. Jude smashed a tailor shop window, helped himself to a new suit and hat, and cleaned out the cash register so he'd have something to put in his new trouser pockets. When St. Jude noticed that none of the police or soldiers were in the mood to stop him, the newly liberated criminal went on a spree. He stuffed his pocket until they were bursting, bundled up the rest in a sheet, and threw it on his back, just as the advanced Wehrmacht scouts rolled up. It was a long walk to Paris. Let me tell you, little brother. But, St. Jude said, reaching into his jacket pocket, I got one of these. He pulled out an automatic pistol and held it in his hand. Where did you get it, Sean said. A fleeing officer was hungry and traded it for a ham I stole. He even told me that it hadn't been fired. St. Jude laughed and took another slug of wine while still holding the pistol. Jean was in awe, but Catfish wasn't impressed. Why, it's just a pea shooter. No better than a Derringer. St. Jude then noticed Catfish. No one is asking you, old man. This is my hideout. And if you don't like my rules, you can get the hell out. Jean, why did you bring an outsider to my hideout? He could be working for the flicks or even the damn Bosch. No, brother, he is a cowboy from the American Wild West. He shot down six Huns at the cafe. You brought a man wanted by the Bosch for killing six of their cours straight to my hideout? St. Jude got up and pointed his automatic at Jean. I should kill you for being stupid and kill this old man for the reward. St. Jude began to laugh, but was cut short by the heavy barrel of the colt smacking him on the temple. The older Malora slid down onto the sloppy floor. Catfish bent over the fallen saint and took his pistol. Help me get him up on the table. He needs to sleep off his drunk. The two of them hefted St. Jude onto his back. Sorry about my brother, Jean said. He's just drunk, that's all. Believe me, I've dealt with worse. We better ford up here for the night and worry about tomorrow in the morning. Once John sat down, the excitement of the day gave way to exhaustion, and he teetered over into a heavy slumber. Catfish waited till John was softly sawing logs before he closed his eyes. It had been an exceptional day, even by Catfish's standards. He was glad it was over. Decades had gone by since the last time he was on the run, and he wasn't as spry as he used to be. Of all the tight spots and close calls he had been through, this one was going to be the hardest, and probably his last. He had to make it count. Welcome back to the Strange West Podcast. This is your host and word hustler extraordinaire, Trentano. That finishes uh, Chapter 3 of Paris High and Noon by yours truly, Trentano. You can pick up a copy of either the paperback or the ebook at parishighnoon.com. For your cowboy versus Nazi fix, visit parishighnoon.com. And if you're also interested in Paris High Noon t-shirts as well as mustache t-shirts, you can pick those up at society6.com slash Trentano. If you're looking for mugs or even a mustache shower curtain, visit society6.com slash Trentano. I would get one if I had a shower curtain. And thanks again to James K. Doyle for lending his voice talents to this podcast. Seeing us out, as always, is Mitch Polzak and the Royal Deuces with their rendition of Eno Maraconis for a few dollars more. If you're listening to this podcast on your 4th of July week, Mitch and the Royal Deuces will be playing at Blondie's Bar in San Francisco this Thursday, July 6th. That is Blondie's Bar on 540 Valencia Street on the corner of 16th in San Francisco. Admission is free and the show starts at 9. 
And once again, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming in and listening to the Strange West podcast. I hope you enjoyed another edition of Cowboys vs. Nazis. We'll see you again next week. Take care and happy trails. Happy trails.